Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to go in tonight where angels fear to tread. <laughs> Only joking. Just want to read a couple of strict scriptures first, and then we'll just look at where we're going. In Obadiah, chapter 1, and the last verse, verse 21, it says, Then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom shall become the Lord's. Saviors, or deliverers, saviors shall come from the Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom then will become the Lord's. And the other scripture I want to read to you is from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and verse 29. It says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friends of the bridegroom who stand and hears him Rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Two things there. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But there's another class of people here. It says, but the friends of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And if you read that, no matter what um, version of the Bible you read it in, it always reads the same. There is the bride, and there is the bridegroom. Okay, so you've got the bride of Christ, you've got the bridegroom, but you've got another person standing there, is the friends of the bridegroom. I want you to keep that in your mind, all right? Because there's differences there. And um, hallelujah. I want to speak tonight and share some thoughts with you uh, on the end times and uh, the Lord's remnant. You know that word remnant occurs 92 times in the Bible. Sometimes the remnant is a bad remnant. But mostly when it's talking in the Bible about a remnant, it's talking about a, a good remnant. And this, this theme runs all the way through the Bible. A good group of people that stand out from the rest. And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the Word of God and look at a few things. And it might be a little different to what you've heard before. But that's okay. And um, I want to read from the book of Revelation, chapter 12. And then we'll go on from there. Hallelujah. Revelation, chapter 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with, with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in the heavens, a great fiery dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. And his tail drew a third of the stars, or angels of heaven, threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before this woman, who was ready to give birth. He stood before her to devour her child as soon as it would be born. And she bore a man-child, who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. 
Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days or three and a half years. And war broke out in heaven and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail nor was there a place found for them in the heavens no longer. So that great dragon was cast out, that serpent uh, of, of old called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. And the accuser of the brethren who accused them day and night before God has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. We'll just stop there for a moment. Just gives us a little background to um, what I want to share with you. We're living in times of this scripture now. And so we need to understand what it is about. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived in the time, a time that foreshadows the time that you and I are living in now. And we need to understand a bit of that. And we know the story. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, right? And he sees a huge statue. And so he's disturbed by this dream. A huge image and this image rep represented some powerful empires um, which had not yet come into being except the first one and so Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and a huge statue which is divided into five kingdoms and he said the kingdom of Babylon the kingdom of uh, media Persia Greece and Rome and finally a kingdom of part iron and part clay. So there were five kingdoms, and Daniel saw it as a great statue. And so the, he was disturbed, and the king Nebuchadnezzar was disturbed about this, and so he broke Daniel in to ask him what this meant. And uh, Daniel interprets the dream. He said, this is a dream. Daniel 2, 36, this is a dream, and we will tell the interpretation before the king. You, O king, art a king of kings, for God of heaven has given you kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whosoever the children of men, wheresoever the children of men dwell, and the beasts and the fields and the fowls of the air have given into your hand. And he has made you ruler over them all. So he said, Nebuchadnezzar, on the statue, you are the head of gold. And he said, but after you will rise another kingdom inferior to you, the media Persian Empire. And after that, another kingdom of Greece. And after that, another kingdom of Rome. Until it came down to the final kingdom in the earth today, which is beginning to be formed as we speak. Okay. And so, Nebuchadnezzar thought, well... He, did, he liked being the head of gold, but he didn't like his empire disappearing, right? So he made a great image, and he said, everybody's got to bow down by this. And he was saying, my head of gold will remain forever. And so he made this image, and everybody had to bow down to that image. And uh, you know the story. Daniel had problems now, and the three Hebrew children had problems because they wouldn't bow down to the image, remember? And so they were cast into the fiery furnace, right. We're interested in the last kingdom. There was a kingdom, a ten-nation kingdom. It had five toes and feet on its foot. And, there, and it says, and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of the potter's clay and part of the iron the kingdom shall be divided but there shall be in it a strength of iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with clay 
And as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle, them, mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another. And I understand that this last kingdom to be formed in the earth is a kingdom of ten toes of iron and clay. I understand that to be made of a democracy, nations which had a democracy and others which were a dictatorship. But it was a mix. They were mixed together. And, uh, and it goes on to say, in Daniel chapter 2, in verse 44, Daniel said, But in the days of these kings, the ten-nation kingdom, shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. Yeah. See, we're living in the days of this last kingdom with ten toes has been formed. But he said, in those days, our day, God will set up his kingdom. So, and it says that they set up, and which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. And so we have this picture, all of these nations through history, all the way down, Greece, where uh, Alexander the Great under, in Greece, the Roman Empire, all of those things, right down to this present day. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, well, if you don't bow down to this, you'll be put to death. We are now living in the formation of this final empire, this final kingdom. We need to understand a little, little bit of this. The, we are now, how can I put this? We are now living in the formation of the last empire, which I call the United States of Europe. The European Union. And it's been formed, put in place, and I want to talk a little about this tonight so you understand what's going on. Now, people have said, well, Nero was the Antichrist, you know? They said, oh, Nero was the Antichrist. Maybe Hitler was the Antichrist, Mussolini, and so on. All of those nations and the leaders of those nations had an antichrist spirit. But they weren't the antichrist. Okay? The last one that's been formed as we speak is the antichrist spirit. And we're now living in that formation that's been formed. We're told... Uh, in Revelation chapter 13, that at the end of the age there will be a false prophet who will arise and prepare and give power to the one called the beast. The beast deceives the nations and requires everyone to take the mark of the beast. We're familiar with that. And it causes all, in Revelation 13, 6, it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man could buy or sell, save that he had the mark on the name of the beast or the number of his name. Okay. Now we know that time is coming. And as Brother Sadhu brought out last night, that Antichrist kingdom, that Antichrist will be able to speak at any time to anyone who has the mark. You have a, you know, we have a, as we say, we have an iPhone. And you can get a text any time, right? But you'll have a mark in there with a chip in it that will, you will hear him speak to that, oh, everyone in the world who has this mark. He will give you the orders, what he requires, what he doesn't require, and you'll hear it audibly in the ear. That's why he says the image spoke. It had a voice and it spoke. And so... We're living in these days where we're heading down to that end. The end of the age. I'm going to be very, very careful here. But I wanted to tell you the present Pope is not the person whom he makes out to be. That's all I'm saying. He is not the person he makes out to be. On the surface, very kind, very nice, 
but he is the one that will be pushing for a world church. Okay, just bear that in mind. It's important we're not naive, you know? And there, there were a group of Pentecostal pastors who went to meet him just recently to ask him the question, is Jesus the only way to heaven, only way to God? And of course he said yes. He's not going to say no, is he? <laughs> See, deception, deception. So all of these things are coming into play at this present time. Causes all small and great to receive a mark. Now, however, God is raising up end time Josephs. You see, there's coming a time when you can't buy or sell, right? So how are you going to live? God is raising up end time Joseph, but you're going to have to trust the Lord as well. You know, one of the greatest main things that we're depending upon is what? Money. And God's going to kick that last prop out from under us where you cannot use money anymore. And he's going to force us to depend upon him. That's, that's the greatest prop we have. That's our greatest dependence. Money. Because we need it to buy, you need it for all of those things. And so, happy days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hallelujah. There is a conflict going on between the seed of the woman, born again believers, and the Antichrist system, which is now forming. But there is one generation of the seed of the woman who will contend with and overcome this Antichrist power and system. I want to talk about that tonight. You know, in Matthew chapter 1, it tells us, it goes through a whole list of um, the genealogy down to Christ. You know, you're familiar with that. And it starts, and uh, right down, let me find it for you. It's Matthew chapter 1, and it's like all the genealogies, all the generations, all the way down to Christ. And it's very interesting. Um, I think Matthew's disappeared from my Bible. <laughs> I've got it. It's, it's now... And the book of genealogies, it starts with, right? The book of genealogies of Jesus Christ, the son of David, starting with Abraham, and it goes all the way down, 14 generations, another 14 generations, and another 14 generations, you know? 42 generations. He said there's 42 generations. But when you add them up, there's only 41. Don't look at me like that. When you get time, go through it and re read every one of those generations. There's a missing generation. So where did that missing generation go? Why is it not there? You know, in Genesis 3.15, God said, And I will put enmity between you, talking to Lucifer, you, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And it shall bruise your head, and it thou shall bruise his heel. Now, Jesus was the seed of the woman, right? He's talking, he's prophesying, he would be born the seed of the woman. He was talking about Mary, and, and um, you, you know, now he, he goes down the line, all the way down, but the last generation is missing. Jesus was born of the seed of the woman. Now we are born again through Jesus, right? Yes. And we become sons of God. So also through Jesus, the seed of the woman, we have the same DNA, right? Born again of the Spirit of God. We have the same DNA as the Lord. And the prophet prophetic word that uh, had reference to Mary, the seed of the woman, being Jesus, but it has also far-reaching implications to you and I today. The prophet Isaiah saw this, you know, 
in a greater light. It says in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, it says, he, speaking of Jesus, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, but he didn't open his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers, he is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8, and he was taken from prison and from judgment. And it says this, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. Where is that lost generation, that final one? It's not in the book of Matthew, it's not in the list. But though it says there's 14, 14, 14, there's not. Jesus never married, right? However, Isaiah said that, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, Isaiah 53, verse 10, and he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Now, he never was married, was he? He shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days in this earth. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall prolong his days. In other words, he never married. But it says he will see his generation and he will live his life and prolong his days in the earth through people who are born of the Spirit of God. That is the lost generation he was talking about. We are it. And so, we are that final, we are that lost, that generation. Prolong, he's going to prolong his days in this earth through us. Yes. All right, you with me? Yes. Through you. You see? You become a child of God. His seed. So he has a generation now after him. It's important to understand this. So he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Now, it's important to understand that God is going to raise up out of his seed a people who will finally crush the head of the enemy. Jesus did that on his cross, on the cross. Now he's made it possible for us, his seed, to do that. The seed of the woman shall crush his head. Happened at the cross, but that has to be performed through us to, in the end of the age to take the enemy down and to bring in the kingdom of God. And so we're at this point. There will be you know, in Daniel 7, 7 it says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall rise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. See? And possess it forever and ever and ever and ever. That's where it says. Now, there will be a remnant, and I want to be very careful with this. There will be a remnant which God will raise up we're not talking about an elite or an exclusive company. You're all invited into this remnant. You all have an opportunity, you have an invitation to become part of this remnant in these last days that will finally bruise the head of the serpent. Take it out. Many are called, but only few end up doing that. But you all have the same opportunity. It says, the church, the woman, the church, brought forth a man-child, which was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, Revelation 1, the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. See? This woman is the church. The church is travailing right now to bring birth, bring 
to birth a company of people. A special company of people with a special job to do. And the church is birth, seeking to birth that. These, she's in travail to bring forth this company of people. And you're invited to be a part of that. And, and we're at that point of time now, this woman clothed with the sun, you know? Malachi 4.3 says, And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes unto your feet, unto your souls, in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord. And he's talking about this end time company of people. We are approaching that day now. So we have this woman clothed with the sun, the son of righteousness. Many, you know, many theologians have a problem with the either or dilemma. Now, they come and look at a prophetic word and say that it either means this or it either means that. But that's not always the case. It usually means both. Right? You know, in the Old Testament, remember, um, I think it was Jonathan Kahn, is reading out of Isaiah where there's, there's this situation which applied to the people in the book of Isaiah and the day as Isaiah, but it was also talking about when the Twin Towers fall. It happened, it was a prophecy for their day, but it had ramifications to the end of the age. And a lot of Isaiah prophecies were, on, were like that. And, um, you know, in Isaiah's day, Israel was a, afraid of an impending invasion. The people wanted a sign from Isaiah to say that they were going to be okay because they were about to be invaded. And so they came to Isaiah and they said, you know, we need a sign that it's going to be all right. And this, Isaiah 7, 14 said, Therefore the Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know how to refuse evil and choose good. For before the child shall know how to refuse evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both kings. So they said, Look, Isaiah... The enemy is right on our doorstep. We need a sign from God that we're going to be, it's going to be all right. And so Isaiah says, okay, I'll, I'll ask God about this. And uh, he said, okay, now the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son, call his name Emmanuel. But how many of you know that, that there was a boy called Emmanuel in the days that was a sign to them that this child would be born, then they call him Emmanuel, and it was signed that the invasion wouldn't take place. But that was foreshadowing another aspect of that prophetic word, speaking of Jesus, would be born a child, and the name would be Emmanuel. It was not either or, it was both. Now that happens quite often all the way through scripture. And uh, that actually happened in, a man, in, in Isaiah's day. But it was a sign pointing to the birth of Jesus. He said, he'll give you a sign. This was pointing to the birth of Jesus. Now, the whole context of Revelation chapter 12 is the end times. And we need to be clear on that. Revelation 12, 2, and the, she, the woman, which is the church, being with child, cried for veiling birth and be paining to be delivered. That's where we are. The church is travailing. And when the, dra when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, the church, and get that gave birth to the man-child. And as soon as this man-child, this group, were born or came to birth, Satan was cast out of his abode, his abode in the third heaven, came to earth, and went after the woman, the church. Okay. However, there was another company of people who he had miscalculated on. Because as soon 
as the child, this man-child was born, it was caught up to heaven. Now that was not the rapture, totally different thing. It was caught up to heaven. And I asked the Lord this, well, why were they caught up to heaven? I had a download the other night that lasted five hours on this. And I wasn't going to preach on this. But he was caught up to heaven, right? What was he doing in heaven? What was this man child, this company of people? They weren't raptured, so why were they caught up to the throne room in heaven? They were caught up to the throne room in heaven to receive their, their commission, yes. the direction, their commission, and their empowerment for their task to take care of the church in the wilderness. You with me? Yes. I know we're crossing a lot of theological. <laughs> It says, you know, and the woman, the church, Revelation 12, 14, and the woman, the church, were given two wings of a great eagle. Now, why didn't he say the wings of an eagle? We all know an eagle's got two wings. But the emphasis is on two wings. And I, I think, you know, those two wings are the apostles and the prophets. That the final end, to end time. Could be wrong. That wasn't in the download. But it could be just that, you know, great eagle, she might fly into the wilderness in her place where she is nourished for a time and half a time from the face of the servant. So it's nourished for, the, for times, times and half time, three and a half years. Now, Revelation 12, 3, and there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. So, we've got all this kind of happening. Same, the same power is, is mentioned in Revelation 3, 13, 1. And I stood on the, upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. A number of years ago, I began to see this beast attempting to rise up out of the Mediterranean Sea just a number of years ago, but it was before its time. Uh, and um, I called a lot, quite a number of people together and I knew who could pray that this would be stopped and it fell back. It wasn't its time, but it is rising. It is rising. The time has come for that to rise. And I stood on the sands of the sea and saw this beast rise up out of the sea. Now, the sea can speak of humanity, the sea, you know, the hum but it also speaks of the Mediterranean Sea where John saw all this, right around the Mediterranean area. And uh, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the, scent, the name of blasphemy. You see, the last of the world empires which Daniel saw before the kingdom of God becomes the kingdoms of this world. He saw this. Now, I don't want to go into the, all the details because we don't have time, but this kingdom is forming in Europe right now. Now, it says in Revelation 13, 4, and they worshipped this dragon and gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? who is able to make war with him. And Revelation 35, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue for 42 months, three and a half years. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God, to blaspheme his name and the tabernacle, and they that dwell in heaven. Right now, the Antichrist is being groomed for his position. Right now, he's alive. He's not possessed by Satan yet, but he's alive and he has been groomed for his position. And I thought, well, I wonder who he is. And I thought, yeah, he's been groomed for this position. But the wings of the eagle, the true prophets and apostles in the earth, the church in those days, 
are also being groomed. Yeah. Remember it says his tail drew a third part of the angels of heaven, cast them into the earth. Third part of the fallen angels were cast into the earth. And she brought, but she brought forth a man child. Right now, there's an opportunity for every one of us, the opportunity to be a part of that company. It's open. You see? Who is this? It says this, and, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared that they should feed her. Who's the they? That's the man child. The context is all of this group of people. I won't talk about that because it's very, very important. Hard times are coming. It's going to become very difficult. And the church will go underground. I think the wilderness is not literal, a literal wilderness, you know. But the church will go underground for at least a period of time. And it will be a very, very difficult time. You know? And there's a theology which says, well, this baby that was born, we're speaking about Jesus who was born, and Revelation 12 is talking about Mary and the birth of Jesus. But that is not possible in this context, you know. Um, first, you know, they say, well, Joseph took Mary and Jesus into the Egypt for a season away from you know, Herod, right? Remember that? And he had, Joseph had a dream and he took her all the way down. But it wasn't a wilderness. It, it was a very wealthy nation, and a great nation, and they weren't there for that length of time. And Satan had not been cast out of heaven at that time. This is speaking of the end of the age. There was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against and see his angels and prevailed not. So he was cast into the earth. Revelation 2.10, And then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Now, he heard a loud voice. He said, Now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God. And the Greek reads like this, and the power of his anointed ones. Christ. This is where the Christ for the Messiah, anointed, but it's the power of his anointed ones, the man child. For the accuser of the brethren was cast down, and he accused them before God day and night. See, there is a remnant that's going to come forth, and it's, we don't need to look at it. You know, in the latter rain movement in the 40s, kind of messed this whole thing up because they made it an exclusive group of people, you know, who you couldn't touch this exclusive. It's not like that. You could be one of these. You're destined to be one of these. You know, many are called, but few prove themselves to be the chosen ones. And so there is going to come a company very soon birthed out of the church. The process of these is first, they will be transfigured. Second, they will be caught up into the heavenly realm. It says they will caught up to the throne room of God. They'll receive their commissionings. Transfiguration is, is, is first uh, and prepares them for the powers of the world to come. That's the process in. So the, Jesus was transfigured, right? Yes. And we are followers of him, right? He paved the way. And so there's a transfiguration takes place, a renewing of the mind and a transfiguration. Caught up to the throne of God, received their instructions. And they are brought back down to this earth. They said, they, you see, who are they that fed this woman in the wilderness? that protected the woman in the wilderness, the church in the wilderness. 
They, that they was the mind child. They were moving in the powers of the age to come. They were the first fruits, right? They were the first to reach that kind of maturity in God. The church is not yet ready to become the bride, but they are forerunners. And listen to me, they are those who are classified as the friends of God. These are the friends of God. They're not the, they're, they're not, yeah, they're not the bride. They're friends of the groom. They're a different category altogether. In the ages to come, they'll have a totally different role than the bride does. But just to understand that somewhat. And so we see this. So we have a woman, the church, giving birth to a group of overcomers who are called up to the throne to receive commissionings for the final battle and to protect the woman, the church, in the wilderness and to feed her, it says. Now, those Christians in the outer court, you know what the outer court is, outer court Christians, don't fare well during this time. In fact, most of them lose their lives. And not that so much as martyrs, they're just not in the right place at the right time. It says in Revelation 11, 12, 11, 2, But the outer court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, and they shall tread it under foot for, for three and a half years. Revelation 13, verse 3, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. See? Okay? There is a tribulation coming. How to call Christians. But there's a remnant. There's a remnant that God wants to bring forth. If we understand this, we'll understand maybe what God is doing in your life, what he wants to do in your life. As things get really bad in the earth, and you know, some whole cities in America will be destroyed. There won't be any, some of these whole cities will be gone. There'll be warfare happening in America. And there'll be Christians, you know? That's a, you're in a wilderness. That this man-child will come on the scene. And there'll be many of them. And they'll meet with you. They'll tell you where there's going to be a disaster and tell you where to move from. They will be moving in the powers of the age to come. They will help protect you. They'll say, there, there is a flood coming in this area. There's an earthquake coming here. You need to move now. The man child will help you move out. And they'll be working in the powers of the age to come. They'll defend you at times when the enemy is seeking to run you down. They'll operate in the powers of the age to come. Just with one word, when the, the, the streets are full of riots and they're coming close to your position, these guys will just speak a word and blind them on sight and they'll become blind. They'll work in the powers of the age to come to prepare and keep the church safe. She needs another three and a half years in order to get ready. And the man child goes ahead and helps her, protects her. Are you with me? Yes. Hallelujah. God is a way of protecting his church, you know. These friends, these, this group have become friends of the Lord. Friends, friends of the groom are going to protect his bride. That's their job. To protect the bride of the groom. They're his friend. Therefore, they're going to protect his bride. They're going to make sure that she makes it through. And we're right at that point where the church is come, it will be start to come in travail to birth a company of people. We're getting close to that. 
You know, the Song of Solomon is about pre preparation of the bride, right? The whole the Song of Solomon. And it says this in Song of Solomon 3, 6. Who is this that comes out of the wilderness? Oh, it's the bride. <laughs> Who is this that comes out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and with all powders of the merchants out of the wilderness? This is the bride. We have a picture if you like, or a full view of this in the life of Esther, who was being prepared. She's a type, a picture prepared as the bride. It says in Esther 2.12, Now every man's maid, maid's turn was to come to the king. And after that she'd been twelve months according to the manner of women, so there were days of their purification. And, you know, six months with oil of myrrh, six months with sweet odors, with other things for purifying. See, that, this, that was Esther. She was a type of the church. And it says, it took some time to get Esther ready. Right? Did, did, this just didn't happen overnight. He, the king said, all right, she's my bride. That she's going to be my queen. And that was just the beginning. She wasn't quite ready yet. She didn't smell right. She had to go through all of this perfumery, all of this kind of stuff. And then it says in Song of Solomon 4 and verse 12, a garden enclosed, you see, is my sister, my spouse, a spring that is shut up and a fountain that is sealed. It says, your plants are the orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, kaffir, camphire, spikenard, spikenide, and saffron, calamus, all of these things. These are the fruit of the Spirit, right? Prepar preparation of the bride. Now, how are these fruit of the Spirit developed? I mean, the Lord just didn't come along and pour some perfume on you and say, that Lou. Not quite like that. How were they prepared? Well, one, in the wilderness. Right? That's point one. She's prepared in the wilderness. And it says then, Song of Solomon, verse four, chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south, and blow upon my garden that the spices thereof might flow out. Let my, God, let my beloved come into my garden and eat of his pleasant fruits. What is the north wind? He said, all right, there's a lot, he's got all this fruit in the garden. That's the church, got all the fruit. Now it says, we need to get you smelling right. We need to get all this perfume, we need to get you ready to be the bride. So, he said, let the north wind blow and it will bring out the fruit in you. You know what the north wind was? It was the coldest wind that can ever blow on Israel. It was like, you know, it was a very cold period. Cold, the north wind was cold. And, uh, You know, I was in Israel at the end of the Yom Kippur War and uh, with my wife and two kids and we were there and the north wind began to blow. Within two hours it was snowing in Jerusalem. It was the weirdest thing seeing camels in the snow. <laughs> it was so cold that north wind, uh, it just came down from the north all the way down across Israel. And this is what he was talking about, you see. North wind speaks of trials, difficult times, not pleasant times. It's a time of tribulation. But out of it comes the people, hallelujah, who have been prepared. The fruit of the Spirit is being developed. The mind child is helping, assisting, he's keeping you safe out there, an underground church, 
These people who are moving in the powers of the age to come, they have the ability and the power to protect and keep and watch over. And they're about to be birthed, you know, soon. You know, Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon him. And it goes on to say in verse 20, he says, Come, my people, just for a little while. He said, Come, enter into your chambers and shut the door behind you and hide yourself for a little while until this indignation has gone past you. Look, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. You're going to be at times without food. There'll be times when there's no power across half of the United States. You know what that means? You know when there's no power in a hospital? Resources will become so scarce, the supermarkets will close. They'll become difficult. There'll be racial wars. There'll be all kinds of clashes. There'll be earthquakes. These men shall come, they will cut, and they'll sometimes come in groups. They'll find you and say, you need to move out of here. You need to move now. Go to some, another place, and then they'll have a place for you to go to while that earthquake passes. That is their job, to care and feed for the woman, feed the woman in the wilderness. See, they came to a, a state in the Lord just three and a half years earlier than the, the, the bride, you know, the church in the wilderness. You hear what I'm saying? You're going to have help. Supernatural help. You're going to have a people look after you. People who are moving in the powers of the age to come. People who can travel. You know, they, uh, and this is what I saw, I was in a download for hours the other night. And I didn't get to, to sleep until four in the morning. And I saw groups of people, they, 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 groups of these people, they pick up about ten people at a time and move them supernaturally to another location. Just supernaturally. They just pick them up and move them and said, you'll be safe here. And they will be able to create food out of nothing. It's a supernatural realm. These have just matured before the, the rest of the church. They've come to a place in God. And God has got these people, this, this remnant, this man-child. And it says that he it took care of them, the church in the wilderness, fed them, helped prepare them. See, it's like the friend of the bridegroom said, we'll help you get your bride ready. We'll look after her, we'll keep her safe. It'll only take three and a half years, but we'll help you, Jesus, get your bride ready. Wouldn't you like to do that? Oh, hallelujah. These are the times we are now living in. And we're not just talking about an elitist kind of thing, you know. Just these have come to this level before you, before the church's bride is made ready. But they are friends. They're classified as friends of the bridegroom. And that will remain out into the eternities to come. It's coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. I talked to you about the European Union. Britain just exited, right? The European Union. Or what I like to call the United States of Europe. It's not a big area, but it's going to be the Antichrist headquarters. You know, you can put Europe into one, one state in Australia, 
the state of Western Australia, you can put the whole of Europe into that state and still have a lot over. You know, Europe's not a big area. And um, they just, ex we prayed, we have prayed for years that Britain would get out of the European Union and leave. Knowing that the destiny of Britain, and if you're listening to this in Britain, knowing that the destiny of Britain would be tied to the outcome of this. England is destined as a sheep nation that could not occur while they were part of the European Union. It was crucial that they exited, got out. The city of Brussels in Belgium has quickly been set up as the Antichrist headquarters. You know, the headquarters was built as a memorial to the Tower of Babel. They built a statue placed in the front of the European head EU headquarters, which is the image of a woman riding the beast from Revelation. It stands right outside. Huge. You know, in Revelation 17, 6, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs and of Jesus. And when I saw, I wondered after her with great admi admiration. This is woman, you know, Babylon. Revelation 7, 3 and 4, and he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw this woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, had seven heads, here it is, ten horns, the same kingdom. The woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, and adained in gold and jewels and pearls, and holding her hand a cup full of the abomination and impurities of her sexual immorality. They have a statue about her riding this beast outside the entrance to the European Union headquarters. It's so blatant. She's depicted as a huge painting, painting on a huge painting in the Parliament's new building in Brussels as well. She's also on the un they they stamp, brought out a new coin, a, a, a European Union coin, that has her on the front of the coin. Now there's a massive crystal palace tower, officially called the Tower Building. This is the fifth parliament in Europe. The seats are, is a massive hemicircle of seats, you know, where they meet in there. And uh, I think there's around 670-odd seats where each nation has a delegate in the seat and they ha all have an allocated seat, you know? And these are, uh, the seats are allocated to members. But one seat remains unallocated. Yeah. Seat number 665 is allocated. 667 is allocated. 666 is empty. And when they're questioned on this, they say that's for a special leader. You got it? Yeah. So, it's so blatant. That's why Britain had to get out of here. You know? It was essential that Britain exited. You remember I shared a year ago about how the Lord spoke to me about Winston Churchill's famous speech, you know, and uh, its prophetic implications. Well, the UK or England has just escaped again. The clutches of that would have, will become the Antichrist dominion and domination. Churchill would be proud of Britain today. And... Uh, Again, it will be said to England, this was one of your finest hours. But most of the Pentecostal church were against exiting it. Statistics now show that. 
They say, come on. You know, come on. This is the seat of the Antichrist. There's coming a great revival in the UK. One, the other night the Lord showed me so clearly, England will be judged. But there is coming revival. There's judgment coming to England because of the legislation, abortions, and the gay movement, and all other kinds of stuff. And I want to tell you, England, if you listen, there's judgment coming to your nation. And you're going to have to go through it. But there's coming great revival as well. Great revival. And... Uh, it's a great time for England. It's, it's, they will move. They'll move on. And the revival that comes to England will be far greater than the Welsh revivals. It'll be wonderful revivals. See, there's a lining up of the sheep and the goat nations right now. But in the middle of it all, the true church. Let me just say this. The Lord told me a number of years ago that America eventually would resist anti at the Antichrist rule. It would be hard, but they will resist some of the laws the Antichrist wants to bring upon this nation. They will resist it, you know? And uh, that doesn't mean that there's no judgment coming. There is. But in the end, at the end, your nation will resist. You know? Hallelujah. In the days of these ten kings, the ten nation federation, it says, Will the Lord set up his own kingdom? He said, There came a stone and smote the feet of that image, and blew away like the wind, and the kingdom of God was established forever. But we've got to go through that, we've got to go there first. You know, I want to get across to you, but the invitation is for you, all of you to go where we're talking about tonight. You've got to press in now. You're running out of time. You've got to press in to the Lord. Press in, press in. Seek. Pray. Let him deal with your life. Be honest, open, upright. Let him deal with you. Hard times are coming. God's going to have a people that will protect the church. Do you want to be part of that company? Yes. You know? It means coming to that level of maturity before the others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, when we were in the Passover stage of our life, we were born again. It was wonderful, right? Born again by the Spirit of God. Then we moved on to Pentecost. We're baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's wonderful. But it's not the end. We're coming to the Feast of Tabernacles. And there is an experience. And that's transfiguration. If, if you want, that's what you want. And pay the price for it. And that reconditions your whole body to travel in the powers of the age to come. Hallelujah. 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 Pentecost, for, that salvation was a real experience, right? Baptism of the Holy Spirit is, was a real experience. There's one more experience. See? Hallelujah. Oh. You know, most of the church, you know, are in the outer court, Christians at the moment. The next level is the P Pentecostal church across the, your nation. Most of them, to be honest, have no idea what's about to come. But you've got to go on. You've got to go on. There'll be criticism. You'll be called all kinds of things. Doesn't matter. Press in. Press in. The door is open. I'll talk a bit about that tomorrow, but the door is open now. And the grace is there for you to press into the next level. That's what you want. 
you can have it. Hallelujah. You know, some interesting the pictures of this, you know. There's a story, a picture of this in the book of Judges, where it talks about Gideon, you know, he rose up and defeated the enemy. Remember that story? Israel was about to be overrun and enslaved by the Midianites. And the, that Midian, the word Midianites means strife and contention. There was a new generation to come up after Joshua who didn't really know the Lord, you know? And they were falling by the wayside. And uh, because the, en the, the country was overrun with the enemy, then an angel appeared to Gideon. And um, Gideon is no different to you and I, you know? The angel said to them in Judges 6.12, An angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon's turning around to see who the angel was talking to. <laughs> you know? He said, Look, I'm from the least tribe and I'm the least in the tribe. He said, No, you're a mighty man of valor. And God is saying that to him, You are mighty people of valor. You've got to step into it. The invitation is there. The invitation is there. And you know, he thinks, oh, well, okay. And uh, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. You all have that capacity. Gideon's name means one who serves or cuts off. God sent a prophet to the nations to tell them that the Lord is going to deliver them. Then this angel arrives and says, the angel saying, you are the man to do it. Gideon says, I'm the least. Well, what? I can't do this. He said, you know, listen to me, God chose the least. He didn't chose the top. He chose the least. That gives us all hope, right? He chose the least. You know, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 says, For seeing your calling, brethren, is not how many wise after the flesh, or mighty, or noble, are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. God says to him, I will be with you and smite the Midianites. God's saying to you, I'll be with you and you can win this battle. So Vin just says, okay, what do I do? So he says, take your father's best oxen, hitch them together to the altar of Baal and pull it down. Gideon says, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's my life gone, you know. And uh, then he said, pull down the idols in the land and restore the commandments of God. That's what he was really saying, you know. Pull down this idol, the statue of Ashtoreth, and replace it with the altar of the Lord. He's saying, I'm dead. <laughs> this is not going to work out. He's thinking, right, this is not going to happen. But anyway, he thinks more, and at midnight, he thinks, well, maybe I can get away with this. So at midnight, he hitches the oxen up, goes down, pulls the statue down, establishes the, the altar of the Lord there, sneaks back to his house, and when he wakes up in the morning, there's an uproar in the city. I don't know how it happened, but they found out that Gideon did it. There's a lot of idols in this land to be pulled down. Anyway, it, it's interesting, you know. The smallest tribe, the least of his brethren. We're just a small remnant, what can we do? There's a company of people who are going to pull down the idols in this land. I don't know what this is. 
but you might know. I was looking at the White House, but there was a line of sight. I was looking down a straight line with a high oblique, like a tower. I don't know what that was, but it was like a big tower, but it was in line with the White House. And there was other, the whole lot, as I watched it the other night, came down. But that obelisk, what is, there must be a, t what is that? That sounded like a roost of chickens talking. <laughs> what? Washington Monument, what does it mean? It's an obelisk, it's coming down. I saw a chuckle. Down. It must have some demonic significance because I saw it, I saw it fall and uh, oh, a company of people are going to pull down the idols in that land, this land and restore the commandments of God, reestablish Bible in the schools, put out new legislation that's God honoring. However, the Midianites and the Amalekites then joined forces and decided we're going to take the city out. We're going to wipe you out. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and the whole group joined him with 32,000. Now, Gideon's feeling a bit better now because he's got someone with him. And, and, and he says, you know, but so Gideon puts a fleece out to make sure God was in this. Not a good idea, but he did it anyway. And... Uh, now God shows up and he says, look Gideon, you've got too many people here. You've got too many in your army. He said, oh, I knew there was a catch. <laughs> There's too many people in your army. He said, tell them who are fearful to go home. 22,000 went home. Gideon's thinking, not good. 10,000 left, He's thinking this is really bad. Then God looks at this and says, Gideon, you've still got too many. Gideon thinking I've had it, <laughs> you know. He said, send them down to the river to drink. Oh, okay. He said, the men who drink using cupped hands, you know, like this, drink in the river, separate them out, but the ones who get on their knees and laugh like a dog, send them home. Gideon's thinking, I'm going to lose more men. <laughs> He's now getting really depressed. <laughs> Only 300 drunk with their hands like this. I said, Lord, that is a really strange thing. What does this mean? You know what the Lord said to me? Those who were not aware of and did not keep their eyes on the enemy are disqualified. Yes. See, if you're drinking like this, you've still got your eyes on the enemy. The majority of the churches in this nation have no idea that the enemy is right at their doors. They're waiting for an escape. But these guys kept their eye. They knew what, was, what they were up against. And say so now down to 300. Oh. So, awareness of the enemy. So he said, okay, this is what you do. He said, you've got to go up. He said, oh, first of the first, he said, Gideon, do you want a prophecy? Gideon said, oh, I need a prophecy. I need a prophetic word. He said, okay, go up at midnight right into the middle of the enemy's camp. He said, I knew, well, I knew there was another catch to this. <laughs> oh, right up into the camp and I'll give you a word. I thought, well, this doesn't look good, Gideon. So he, when night comes along, he gets right up there. You know, there's tents, there's thousands of soldiers up there, 
and there's tents everywhere, there's guy ropes everywhere, and he's trying to, in the pitch dark, get, walk him to, into the middle of the camp. And sat, he, so he gets there, and he's waiting for this word from the Lord. And right, the tent right next to him, two guys are asleep. And suddenly one of them has a nightmare. They think, that's it. He's waking the whole camp up, shouting and yelling. And uh, he said, the guy that's sleeping next to him said, what, what, what's the matter with you? He said, a, a cake of barley bread tumbled down into the most host of the hidden uh, 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 camps and tent, and our tent fell down. And he said, Gideon's thinking, a loaf of bread falling down the hill into a camp, and the camp kills them. Is that the word of the Lord, or is that the prophetic word, Lord? I, I said, he doesn't understand this. So the other guy says to him, what does it all mean? He said, the, if the Israelis are going to come and kill us all. <laughs> Barley loaf? <laughs> the kid is not thinking, well, that's a better word. So Gideon goes back to the guys and says, this is what we've got to do. At midnight, first we get our lamps together, but keep the light hidden. Don't, you know, keep it in there. And so, and we're going to go up at midnight, and we're going to blow our trumpets and break our pitchers so the lights shine. The guys are thinking, we're going to go up at midnight and t let everyone know that we're there. <laughs> we're going to blow a trumpet. And then we're going to break these pictures in all the 300 lights so they know exactly where we are. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know the story. A huge noise, trumpets are breaking of the pictures and suddenly lights appear in where there's utter confusion and the enemy starts killing each other. That was one man, the least in the kingdom. <coughs> this invitation is open to everybody. I don't care who you are, man, woman. The invitation is going out. Do you want to be an overcomer? Do you want to be the first fruits of this? The first to ripen? The first to come to maturity before the others? Do you want to be in a place where you can help the church mature? Yeah. Feed them, protect them, keep them? This is your destiny, you know? It's open to all. Many are caught. We don't have a lot of time left. God has a way of protecting his bride, you know? We're going to have help. Really good help. What I saw the other night, it's very hard for me to describe the things that these people were able to do, this man child was able to do. They, re they went up to the throne, got their empowerment, their orders, instructions, came back to this earth, and they, the man child, nourished, it says, and fed the bride and brought her to maturity. But it was in the midst of terrible persecution and terrible conditions that she was brought to maturity. The north wind blew. It was a cold time. But that time in the wilderness started to bring out the fruit of the Spirit. Until, like Esther, she was ready to save much people alive. You know, it, it's like, well, you're right there. Gideon is no different to you and I. 2 Timothy 1.9, he saved you, called you with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. That's speaking to you. Called you with a holy calling. 
Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate. Whereby are giving exceeding precious promises that you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in this world. So Peter said, whereby giving us exceeding great and precious promises, partakers of the divine nature. And besides this, Second Peter 1, 5, add all diligence to your faith, virtue, and virtue, knowledge and knowledge, temperance in your life, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love, become love like Jesus. For if these things be in you, inside you, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says, he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. So give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If these things be in you, get it right. Make sure the first thing is the first thing. Amen. Get it right. These things have to be in you. And when they're in you, you're heading towards another level, another level, another experienced transfiguration. You know what transfiguration is? It's like it's like when your spirit becomes so full of life, it just explodes through every essence of your entire being transforming it. That's what happened to Jesus, right? Yeah. Then he went about his business as normal after that. But there are certain things he did after that which he had, couldn't do before. He could only do them after he was being transfigured. But his whole body was glorified. Every atom had changed. There's a purity running in an incredible way when this happens to us. This world has been in the process, it's in the process of being reshaped. You know, a world court is now gaining power and influence that will be forced upon the nations. Our courts of the normal nations will not matter any longer because the courts of this new Antichrist kingdom will have the power. Economic sanctions will be a major tool in the rise of the and a Christ spirit. That's why we need the Josephs at this time. Lawlessness will be deliberately created to and allowed in many nations in order to soften the people up, to pray them for a totalitarian government or an antichrist government. Actually, that's happening in your nations now. A lot of the lawlessness has been organized at high levels. They just a few years ago, I had a prophetic experience, like an interactive vision, I call them, in which I could talk with people. In it. And I saw Christian communities. Um, the time period was the first Time, the, the time period of this was the beginning of the rule of the Antichrist, the first court, the first part of the rule of the Antichrist. And I saw Christian communities, and um, some of these communities housed Jewish refugees. Let me tell you something, the spirit of Hitler is going to rise in Europe again, and Germany again. That's another thing I got in this download. It's coming back to me, the spirit of Hitler going to arise in Germany, but in the end, Germany will assist Israel, but it's going to arise there first. Some of these communities have Jewish refugees. Christians were helping them and ministering to them. Others were just Christian communities. Um, some large, some very large, but some small, small as one or two families. Some were fortresses of truth and light, 
but they all had one thing in common. Um, they were all covered with a huge transparent dome. You know, huge. And I looked at this, I was looking at this, you know, it would, two houses were just covered. Other times it was, a whole town was covered, small town. And I looked at this and just stood there watching. And I watched people come in and come out and come in. Then I watched the man come in and he walked up against it and went crack. Couldn't get in. I thought, ooh, okay. Then I watched demons come up. They couldn't get in. They could, couldn't just get into there. And I thought, Lord, you know, what is this? The only point I said to the Lord, what are these domes made of? He said, these domes are the covering of my blood. But listen, this was the, and he looked at me and said, and which I tried to take in, he said, my blood is no longer red, it's light. I said, whoa. Covered. I thought of, you know, I didn't want to make that a doctrine, but I thought of the children of Israel during the Feast of Passover, you know, everything fell on Egypt but didn't fall on them. Then I tried to walk through it. I thought, I'll have a crack at this. I walked through it very slowly and walked right on the inside. And the power and the presence and the anointing and the light inside those domes was incredible. And some of those domes were as big as a large, a small town, you know? And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. Fantastic. And I thought, oh. I asked the Lord for a scriptural example of this. Still in this vision, I asked the Lord for, and he looked at me and said, haven't you read Psalm 91? I said, I knew that. <laughs> you know? See, God has a way to keep his people safe. But we must be walking in the truth and we must be walking in the light. These are the days in which we are living. Close to us. Close to us. The whole of the United States is going to go through a terrible shaking. But millions are going to come to the Lord. Hallelujah. It really is. Millions. A remnant. God is about to bring forth a remnant. He's about to bring forth a people who've matured ahead of the others. Their destiny is different. These friends of the bride are going to do incredible exploits, moving in the powers of the age to come. And the invitation is, is this what you want? Is this your destiny? Is this the reason why you are here at this time? The invitation goes to you. And so we need, you know, we need to seriously be aware of what's going on around us now. The time frame that we are in. The church is about to birth another class of people who will come to maturity before the rest. And at that point it says the enemy, Satan, will try and wipe out the true church. But she will escape into a wilderness, probably underground. And they'll have a man child whose job is to prepare a bride for the groom. That's what friends of the groom are. Are you ready for this? 
I would never have preached this a year ago. But you see, the time is right. And the grace is here. And move into it. And we can have that grace if that's what you want. I want to read and draw to a close quickly now with a, in a prophetic experience I had in June 2008. I wrote it down so that I wouldn't miss anything. I came down to my office to pray. It was early in the morning, about half past five in the morning. I came down to pray. And as soon as I started to pray, I found myself in a place I was not familiar with. It was like paradise-like. The setting was warm. Um, and the atmosphere was invigorating. The Lord was at my side and started to talk to me. And he, 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 he said things like this. He said, white is the color of purity and black usually speaks of evil. He said, however, in your world, things are rarely black or white. I thought, that's true. He said, the process of purification is somewhat slow, but in these days, it's been speeding up. He said, filters serve to purify, but filters must be applied in order for them to be effective. You must apply the filters. I knew he was talking about Philippians 4, 8, you know? Um, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, good report. If there be any virtue, think on these things. This filter must be applied, he said, to your mind and to your emotions. Then he said, seek those things which are above in heavens where I dwell. He said in Colossians, you know, Colossians 3 verse 1, he said, if then you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. In other words, he's saying, set your mind on things above. At the right hand of God, set your affections, that's your emotions, you know. On, on, on things above and not on the earth. As he was saying this, I, I was beginning to think of, you know, how much our thoughts and emotions and desires are so earthly orientated. How like Enoch, you know, we must become more at home in the heavenlies than we are on this earth. Jesus continued, he said, you know, we were created to walk on this earth in our bodies while our spirit soared into the heavens. He said, you were created for this. Then he said this, you must seek to walk in the heaven's standards and ways while you walk with me as you do. My realm will become more real to you if you do this. He said, purification is a cooperative process. My light and my presence will purify you and keep you pure, but you must be diligent and set your mind on the heavenly things. My world of light, he said. He said, holiness simply means to be separated from that which defiles you. But when he was speaking to me, it was, it sounds bland now while I'm telling you this, but the atmosphere and it was penetrating me at such a rate that I could hardly stay on my feet at this, uh, on, at, at this time. And, you know, and he said, he said this, I rarely enter your realm. He said, you must enter my realm. I thought about that. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 16, let us, there, let us come boldly into his realm. You know, then a man stepped forward. I hadn't realized that he was there, and it was Joseph. He said, I succeeded through the wisdom of God. Joseph looked at me with intense, penetrating eyes. He said, much of the wisdom I manifested came through me through dreams, he said. Dreams are the way that God can speak to you by bypassing the natural mind. The natural mind, he said, is an enemy. 
with the mind of the Lord. He looked at me intently, he said, purify your mind, your emotions. He said, your personal dream life, your imagination must become pure in order for the flow of communication from the Lord to you come, is unhindered. He said, clarity in the spiritual realm requires clarity and purity in your soul life. At that point, Jesus spoke again to me. He said, in the days that lie ahead, my people will need to hear me clearly. He said, because my voice is your life. It is written, my words are spirit and are life. And the time is coming where there will be no longer time to rectify mistakes. I thought, ooh. He looked at me and firmly said, the time is short. You must work while it is day, for the night cometh. No man can work. Then Joseph spoke to me again. He said, in my day, the issue was food as famine stalked the land. He said, in your day, there will be many kinds of famine. He said, there'll be a famine of the true word of God. I thought, boy, how true that is. Famine of the true insight and foresight. In many places, he said, water will be so scarce that countries will go to war over water rights. And when he said that, the implication was, you need to think of this, and whatever you're doing, wherever you are, make sure that water is available. Plenty of water available in Lancaster. <laughs> Famine of the true word of God, he said. He said, many will die. I didn't say many. He said, millions will die from hunger. Prepare for the days that lie ahead, he said, both in the spiritual and in the natural. You must stay connected to the Lord at all times. The pleasures of life and living in a secular world can quickly muddy the true waters of life. Seek the Lord and to know him, for only he can purify you. This is Joseph talking. Then he looked at me really intently. And he said, you must forgive those who have hurt you. And I thought, oh, um, okay. Betrayed you. And those who have spoken against you. He said, forgive your brethren. If you do not, you will be, and he used this word, haunted by those things. He said, when I forgave my brethren, redemption and reconciliation took place, which affected the destiny of many. Remember he forgave his brethren? He said, when I forgave, he said, redemption and reconciliation took place which affected the destinies of many people. Then the Lord looked at me and he said this, will you be found worthy? And that's not a good question to ask any person because I knew he wasn't looking for an answer. He knew me inside out. <laughs> I thought about this question, but I thought I didn't quite know how to answer it. And I said, the only way I could, he said, but I, I thought about it and I said, I knew the only way that I could complete and finish my course was to walk with the Lord in purity, love, and faith. And, and that he is able to keep me from falling and straying from the pathway of holiness and light. He never said anything back, but he listened to what I said. I thought, wow. Any Chris, he, he, the, the, it was quiet for a while. Nobody said anything, and I was just thinking. And then the Lord just quoted a scripture. He said, in John three thirteen, he said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. I thought, oh, okay. Jesus, in other words, was both in heaven and earth at the same time. He said to me, this is the way you must now live. 
He was in heaven and earth at the exact same time. It says, no man ascended into, up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is now in heaven. But he was on the earth when he was talking this. It slowly came to start to come to an end. I was just standing there trying to think it in. And Joseph broke into my thoughts. He said, Jesus will return in your day. You must be ready. Time is short. You must prepare and feed the harvest. And the harvest that you will reap. Feed them with the right food and they will mature more quickly than any other preceding generation. He said, be diligent. Be determined. Finish your course with joy. The reality of that world began to fade you know, back in my room. You know, he said, Jesus will return in your day. Look, I'm 76. And he said, Jesus will return in your day. Sure, I might reach 100. Oh, heaven forbid. But <laughs> <laughs> he said, Jesus will return in your day. There's not much time left. The Antichrist kingdom is being, as we speak, set up in, being set up in Europe. With the headquarters in Brussels. It's starting to go down. It's coming. In the midst of all this, there will be a company of Joseph's. You know, whose role in the midst of great tribulation and famine, his role was to save much people alive. We're going to have to feed whole cities. you to feed your family. We can't just bury our head in the sand and say, oh, you know, it's another nice conference and it's great. We may not have another conference. I hope we do. <laughs> but we may not have another conference. Everything starts to turn this year. I'll talk about that tomorrow. But everything, 2016, the turn comes. It will not be the same next year at this time. We'll be in a different world altogether. So, what you should you be doing? Well, you press into the Lord with all of your heart. You give him your time. You give him your focus. You give him your life. You find out what your destiny is. You know you have a destiny simply to bring heaven to earth. Find out in what area of your world and your life you will bring heaven to earth in. You have a destiny. The fact that you are alive in this generation, Amen. you have a destiny. The seed of the woman will finally finish this. Jesus has one generation. He said this last generation, that 42nd generation which is missing in Matthew chapter 1, is here today. And David said, this was written for a generation to come, and it was this generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, you could have been born in the middle of the Dark Ages. That wouldn't have been good, you know. But you deigned it that you would be here tonight, today, and this dispensation. Why? Because your destiny is connected with this last day's purposes of God in this earth. Let's just pray, shall we? And it's just to be still for a moment.
it's important that we are not just a hearer of the word but that hearing the word triggers action. Now the Lord is standing here tonight and he's watching, he's looking. And many, many angels You know, God is requiring of you tonight a response in some way. Knowing the days that we live in. It requires a response, a commitment, you know, in the sense of not just hearers, but a commitment to seek, to find Brother Sardo was saying, you've got to find why you are here in this generation. Why are you here? That was a deign to be here before you were born. You have a role to play. You have a part to play. No matter you're old, young, married, unmarried, mothers with children, you have a part to play, which is tailored to you, of bringing heaven to earth, manifesting Jesus in this earth. It is time for you to seek the Lord with all of your heart, so that you understand your destiny, what it is. So that you know why you are here. And let me just say this, you know, things change. There's a change like this year will make a change and your destiny might take another step forward or be enlarged. You need to be aware of that. Um, 2016 is the year, you know, and it's going, there may be further steps in your destiny, further things to understand in it. And the grace of God is here. He wants to impart that to you this year so that you know, you understand, you have an understanding of it. And it's in such a way that you will be able to move forward from where you are today to further into your destiny. Enlargement, I, I keep seeing, and seeing this word, enlargement, enlargement, enlargement. You know? And it's like, whatever you've been doing now is going to be enlarged. If, if you know your destiny, it's going to be enlarged again. Things are going to change for you. And they'll change this year. see many angels looking intently. Father, I pray that there'll be an impartation of understanding, knowledge and understanding. Let there be a download into the lives, Lord, of your people. An enlargement, further understanding of their destiny. And if they haven't understood it yet, there may be a beginning of an understanding. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that as they sleep, you begin to speak to them in dreams. You begin to quicken your word to them in such a way that there comes understanding. Look, for every one of you, things are going to change. Now, you know, if you're a pastor, housewife, Whatever you're doing, young person, there's a change this year. There's an enlargement coming. God wants to give you insight and foresight. Once you know and once you understand that and you accept it, then he will equip you, whether it's financially or 
through spiritual gifts or whatever, abilities, he will equip you for it. But it's time to step up again to another level. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The Lord is really searching, searching your hearts. His angels are looking intently at you. It's like God is requiring a response. He's saying, you can be a part of this company. Get in with the least in his tribe, family, and he said, you're a mighty man of valor. Look, you're a mighty woman of valor. You're a mighty young person of valor. You're here to effect change. Standing in the kingdom of God. Things that have been the same for a long time are about to change. They're about to change. You've got to be open to change. Don't be afraid of change. You've got to be open to change. This is the year. It's a pivotal year. Father, I pray for these people. I ask for your angels to impart to them over the next few days as, and as they continue to seek you. There's so many angels here tonight. I, I, and some of these angels will go with you and help you to understand your purpose and your destiny. They'll go with you tonight and they'll be with you for maybe a few months. I don't know. But there is, is enough to go around. And they, if that's what you want, He's sincere in knowing the change. He's sincere in knowing your purpose and the plan and your destiny. They will go with you. One will go with you and help you with this. Father, I just place these people into your hands. I pray that the angels of the Lord that are here tonight will go with them as they leave this place and stay with them till they have understanding, revelation, insight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just commit these people into your hands. Be kind to them. Be gracious to them. Bless them, Lord. I bless them. I bless them. I bless them. Let revelation spring up within them. Let understanding, insight, and foresight, Lord, come to them in Jesus' name. God has a way where there seems to be no way. He has a way. Some of you say, well, I'm locked in to situations that hinder you and are not of your necessarily making. I ask you, Lord, to make a way for these people. Make a way, supernaturally. Make a way for them. Change their circumstances. Do what is necessary to... to Open up a way for them, I pray. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus, make a way. I keep getting that. Where there is no way, he will make a way for you. Where there is no way, your destiny cannot be hindered by people. He will make a way where there is no way for you at the moment. He will change the circumstances. If this is what you want, to press into the Lord and find your destiny and purpose and flow in it faithfully, he will make a way for you. The time has come. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord sees you different to how you see yourself. You mighty women of valor, 
mighty man of valor. He's calling you. He can do it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hmm. Many ministries are on the point of change in some way. You know, and it's good. Things are going to change. Things are going to change for you. Things that you've held on to for years, things are going to change. He's going to do it. Oh. Thank you, Lord. All kinds of changes. Some of you are going to move house. Some of you are going to move, you know, where you live. There's going to be a shake-up in order to bring his plan together for you and others in your life. It'll start this year. The shake-up is coming. But it's good. It's good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 God will make a way for you where there is no way. He'll move heaven and earth for you so that you fit into your calling purpose. Father, I just commend these people to you tonight. Bless them, Lord. Lord, bless them and keep them. Let your hand be upon them continually. Let revelation continually flow into their lives. Let understanding come, Lord. Give them faith and endurance to pursue that which you're calling them to. Or I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.